It seems like any given day, you can find a growing collection of red flags that the Republican Party is marching further and further away from democracy. Consider this week's batch alone. 2020 election lies took center stage at Colorado's GOP State Assembly, a gathering for the state party to pick who will be on their primary ballots. And in a number of races, candidates pushing election lies received the strong majority of votes, meaning that they're going to be placed at the top of their tickets like Mesa County Clerk and top primary candidate for Secretary of State, Tina Peters, who has continued to push the lie that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. But she's also been indicted for her alleged role in election tampering and misconduct, as well as obstruction of justice relating to the breach of her county's 2020 election system. But Colorado Republicans were not the only ones tripling down on the big lie. In Alabama, incumbent Governor Kay Ivey cut this TV ad for her primary campaign titled Stole. The fake news, big tech and blue state liberals stole the election from President Trump. But here in Alabama, we're making sure that never happens. We have not and will not send absentee ballots to everyone and their brother. We ban the corrupt curbside voting, and our results will always be audited. Mm. So that is what is happening at the state level right now. And maybe even more concerning are Republicans like Mitch McConnell, who have denounced Trump, actually hasn't even spoken to him in months, but he did say that he would jump right back on board if he needed to. And you said Donald Trump's actions preceding the January 6th insurrection were a, quote, disgraceful dereliction of duty, and that he was practically and morally responsible, morally responsible, your words, for provoking the events of that day. How do you go from saying that to two weeks later saying you'd absolutely support Donald Trump if he's the Republican nominee in 2024? Well, as a Republican leader of the Senate, it should not be a front-page headline that I will support the Republican nominee for president. Well, that committee to power and party is leaving us with one of two political parties entrenched against democracy. We are in a dangerous moment that we all need to pay attention to. Joining me now is Donald Trump's niece, Mary Trump. She's the host of The Mary Trump Show and the founder of the Democracy Defense Fund, which will work to elect pro-democracy candidates. Mary, thank you for being here. I heard you say in an interview the other day that democracy is on, quote, a knife's edge. Can you explain what you meant by that? Sure. And first of all, Katie, congratulations. I'm so honored to be here on your first show. Uh, it's fantastic. We need more people like you doing the work, um, because as your, say, your show today uh, demonstrates, lack of accountability is one of the reasons democracy is on a knife's edge. And by that, I mean, we are in a situation where the next two elections particularly, I think, 2022, will determine whether or not America in the future is a democracy or an autocracy. It's that serious. It seems like everything is so exigently pressing. Everything is so urgent. I want to read this excerpt from the upcoming book, This Will Not Pass, about Trump's efforts to push the big lie around last year's runoffs in Georgia. The quote is, Trump believed he knew why conservative voters lacked an enthusiasm for Purdue and Leffler. He explained as much to Mitch McConnell. Brian Kemp, the governor, defended the election as safe and secure, even though Biden won his state by a small margin. Voters would not stand for this, Trump believed, and neither should Purdue and Leffler. I mean, Mary, Trump's strategy in the Georgia runoff was to just continue to say that the election was rigged, but we all know how that worked out for him in Georgia. Right now, though, right ahead of the primaries in the midterms, you've got plenty of Republican candidates that are fully embracing election lies. Do you think that's actually going to backfire for them? I don't, actually. What, what we see time and time again is Donald float a trial balloon and see what happens. Uh, in Georgia, it didn't work, but that's because at the time it seemed so outrageous. How, now, however, Republicans are seeing their opportunity. This may be one of their last chances to grab power, because that's all they're interested in, maintaining power at no matter what cost and no matter how illegitimately. So we're in a situation a year later where 
in order to be a viable Republican candidate, you have to pretend that you believe the 2020 election was stolen from President Biden. How does that work, though, Mary? Because, you know, we, we talked about, as an example leading up to you, the Senate leader Mitch McConnell, right? He's trying to have it both ways when it comes to Donald Trump, still pledging fealty to him, still pledging loyalty, right, if he ends up being the party nominee, but at the same time condemning him for January 6th. It seems like total abject hypocrisy to me, seems like completely inconsistent, and yet he's not the only one who embraces this concept. Yeah, I, I, the Republicans don't care about hypocrisy. I think that's also a requirement in order to be uh, an elected Republican official these days. But we also need to remember, though, that um, before January 6th, McConnell was aware of the machinations behind the scenes uh, that were being promoted by Donald's oldest son, Donnie, and many, many others. And yet, the mainstream media characterizes the fact that, Donald, uh, that McConnell did nothing to pu publicize this potentially treasonous behavior. He was considered strategic. So to describe somebody as strategic who is perfectly comfortable not saying anything about a potential coup uh, is very dangerous, because the real word to describe him is traitorous. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I was smiling, Mary, not because of the seriousness of the concept, but because I think I hear your your African gray Sebastian tweeting and singing along, um, I think, his agreement with what you're saying. So um, just how far, though, Mary, do you think the Republican Party will travel into what I call the land of the lies if it doesn't actually if it doesn't actually face some kind of accountability now, either in our judicial system or at the ballot box, for example, in November? Katie, I'm extraordinarily worried about this, and that's one of the reasons I started the Democracy Defense Fund. This is going back to 2020, the fall of 2020, before the election. At that point, we saw Donald laying the groundwork for making claims after the election that hadn't already ha hadn't happened yet, uh, that it was stolen from him if he lost, right? So I said then, and it's even more true now about the entire party, that Donald would stop at nothing. There was no bottom here, and the entire party has embraced that philosophy, if you want to call it that. They will will stop at nothing. We see it happening with extreme gerrymandering. Uh, the la latest case is DeSantis in Florida. Mm -hmm. We see it happening with outrageous numbers of voter suppression laws. And worse, we see it uh, with voter subversion, which you described at the beginning of the segment, where uh, candidates for secretary of state in many different states, including Colorado and Georgia, are saying right now that if a Democrat wins an election, they will not certify those results because they will automatically consider that result illegitimate. Mary, I'm glad you mentioned that new pack. You just launched it. It is called the Democracy Defense Fund. I have to ask, though, did you start this pack because you felt like there was maybe something missing in terms of the work being done to elect candidates who are as committed to democracy as you think they should be? No, not at all. Uh, in fact, there are many, many great organizations out there. Uh, and one of our goals of the Democracy, Democracy Defense Fund is to help support those organizations, because there's no sense in doing the work twice. Um, That's right. The other reason, though, or the main reason, I should say, is because this is an opportunity to elevate other voices. It's an opportunity to educate people about those things I just mentioned, voter suppression and particularly voter subversion. It's an opportunity to educate voters what is at stake, because I think so much gets uh, twisted by the mainstream media. They focus on inflation instead of the reasons for it. You know, as I said earlier, they consider McConnell's silence uh, about what was going on behind the scenes to overturn the election as good strategy instead of, you know, pro-insurrection behavior. Uh, and we need as many people on the ground as possible looking at the entire map, helping people understand what are the most important elections to donate money to if they're able to donate, which are the most flippable races, which races are most pivotal electorally, which races 
again, like Secretary of State races, are uh, do we need to win so that we can ensure that elections in those states will be called uh, in a way that is uh, trustworthy and in a way that does reflect the will of the voters. You know, Mary, in addition to the PAC, in addition to your Substack, in addition to all the books you've been writing, you're also the host of a podcast called The Mary Trump Show. As someone who's fighting for democracy, what are you hoping that your listeners are going to get, other than obviously listening to something entertaining and good, but they're going to tune in and, and you're selecting certain guests to join you. What do you think they're going to get from listening to your podcast as well? Well, on Thursdays, we have a one-on-one -on -one in-depth interview with somebody who uh, just has a very deep understanding of the state of play. So that one is about helping people understand, in general, what is happening in this country, what uh, what the differences are between the Democrats and the Republicans, because this is not, these are not normal times. And I think one of the greatest mistakes that's been made in the last year and a half is that the Biden administration has been treated as a normal administration that has followed another normal administration, and nothing's farther from the truth. And the Biden administration's accomplishments need to be seen in that context, as do the dangers we face, right? And then on Tuesdays, uh, we have a panel that's called the Strategy strategy sessions. And that is a deep dive into, again, helping people understand why this midterm election is so important, but getting from the perspective of experts about what we can do, not politicians, not the media, but we, what we as American voters can do to make sure that American democracy is preserved and hopefully strengthened, and that if you want to preserve American democracy, you have to vote for Democrats simply because the Democratic Party is the only party in this country right now that is pro-democracy. And on that note, Mary Trump, I want to thank you for your time and your insight, but we also have to send our regards to Sebastian, so thank him as well. Thank you, Katie. It was so great to be here, and Sebastian wishes he could be watching the show. We're going to catch it later, though. Got it.